Good. Hey guys, we're going to begin here in just a few minutes, but before we do, if I could get you guys to scoot into the middle some, if there's some room uh, on your pews, we've got some more folks coming in, and as you can see, we're running out of space, praise God for that, but if you would, uh, please scoot in so that the ushers can place people uh, without having them to go into the overflow. Thanks, we'll begin in just a few minutes.
welcome to Ingemar Baptist Church. Happy Easter, He is risen. I am Jordan Jones, and we are so glad that you're here to worship with us. Here are a few things that are happening on the Hill. Thanks to you, we have received $6,754.51 towards the Annie Armstrong Easter offering. A benefit for Carson Grisham will be held in the FLC this Saturday, April 6th. A barbecue meal will begin at 3 with an auction to follow beginning at 5. A spiritual formation class for all new believers, 7th grade and older, or anyone wanting to grow on their walk, will be starting next Sunday, April 7th, during the Sunday school hour. There are sign-up sheets in both foyers for anybody interested in participating in the six-week class. Church Bible Drill for children and youth will be held at 2 o'clock next Sunday afternoon. Bible Buddies will be recognized during the evening service at 6 p.m. along with the participating children and youth. Finally, if you're visiting with us, please take a second to scan the QR code or fill out a guest card and stop by the welcome desk on your way out to pick up a free gift. That is what's happening on the Hill. Happy Easter and thank you so much for being here to worship with us. Lady, she's my wife. <laughs> Amen. Well, I just want to start off this morning by saying He is risen. Amen? Amen. 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 What a joy it is to be here with you on this holy day, to come together corporately as a church to worship. Uh, I just want to say, first of all, welcome. If you're here visiting with us, uh, welcome on behalf of all of us here at Ingemar. Welcome. My name is Brother Rob Jones. I serve as the senior pastor here at Ingemar Baptist Church. And uh, if you're visiting with us, take a second and scan the QR code that's in the front of your pews or fill it out. Uh, if you're a first-time guest, and then stop by the welcome desk on your way out, and we have uh, a gift bag that we would like to give you uh, to let you know how much we appreciate you being here to worship with us this morning. So once again, I'm so grateful. Jesus Christ is our risen Lord, and we're here to celebrate that this, that this morning. So if you would, join me in prayer, and we will begin. So pray with me. Father, we come to you now, and we thank you so much. Lord God, just to be able to have the chance to come into this place to worship you. Lord God, I pray that just for a little while that you would help us to put all the distractions and the noise and the confusion out of our minds and that, Father, we might be able to worship you in spirit and truth here, Lord, just for this short while. Lord, I pray now, I ask that you place your hand of blessing, that you fill this place with your Holy Spirit, that, Father God, we would know that you're God and that you're risen and that today you are alive. Lord, we love you and we thank you. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. John the Revelator wrote, in Jesus' words, I was dead, but behold, I am alive forever and forever and forevermore. I serve a risen Savior. Let's stand together and worship. I serve a risen Savior. Yes. 
sing a medley of choruses that some of you know and some of you are going to learn, but we're going to worship together, okay? Don't be afraid if you sing the wrong word at the wrong time on the wrong note. We will make a joyful noise. Why? Because we are worshiping our God. This is our God. Corinthians 5 says, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them.
2 Corinthians 5 closes with this verse. For our sake, He made Him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in Him we might become the righteousness of God.
Amen. 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 Let's pray. Dear Lord, we come to you right now. And as we set aside this next portion of our service time, just, dear Lord, I ask that you help us to just clear our hearts, clear our minds, and just be ready, ready to hear your word this morning. Lord, I know that there's probably a lot of things going on this afternoon. Don't let us think about those things, but to focus on you and your word right now. Dear Lord, please be with Brother Rob. Just hide him behind your cross this morning. Just give him the words to say that we all need to hear, to be just growing in our walk with you. Dear Lord, I love you. And dear Lord, I thank you for all that you do for me, do for us every single day. In Jesus' name, amen. To breathe the air of heaven Where pain is gone And mercy fills the streets To look upon The one who bled to save me And walk with him For all eternity There will be a day when all will bow before him. There will be a day when death will be no more. Standing face to face with he who died and rose again. Holy, holy is the Lord. And every The songs of faith we sang through doubt and fear. In the end, we'll see that it was worth it when He returns to wipe away our tears. Oh, there will be a day when all will bow before.
Amen and amen. Wow. Man, I just, let's just give to preaching and go back to singing. <laughs> what a joy it is to be with you here this morning. It really is. If you have your copy of God's Word, take your Bible and open with me to the book of Matthew, the gospel according to Matthew. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. This is the first book of the New Testament. I went and got invited to preach at Blue Mountain Christian University a little several months back, and I made the mistake. I got so ahead of myself and wound up. I said, turn to the book of John. That's the first book of the New Testament. And then I thought, oh, wait, no, that's not right. You know, it was too late then. So this is really the first book of the New Testament. Matthew chapter 28, the last chapter, the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 28, we're going to look at the, verse, the first eight verses here in just a moment. Have you ever noticed this, though, that, that the way you react to something really describes and it shows how you feel deep down inside, how you believe something to be, right? So uh, uh, you, you react in a certain way because inside of you, you feel a certain way towards Something. Let, let, me, let me put it to you like this. So, I don't know if I should say this, Colt or not, but I hate snakes, okay? I hate them. I am scared to death of snakes. Some of you know that. Some of you don't, okay? Uh, so don't, look, we're not a snake passing church, and as long as I'm the pastor, we're not going to be a snake passing church, okay? I hate them, okay? I hate snakes. I am deathly afraid of snakes. There better not be a snake when I get to my office, okay? I don't like snakes. I don't like snakes. Okay, so one day I, I owned a vegetable farm, and, and one day I was out um, bush hogging one day, and uh, I'm out there mowing all this stuff down, all this junk, and I'm on this Kubota tractor. Mind you, it's a big tractor with a cab and air and everything, and I'm inside the tractor, and I'm driving this tractor, and I'm bush hogging, and I'm mowing, and the next thing I know, a snake slithers out in front of the tractor, and I thought, well, he's fixing to die. So, I, so I, get this, I get the tractor, right, and I'm afraid of them, okay? I'm afraid of them, and I start trying to run the snake over with the tractor. And let me tell you, let me tell you, okay, snakes have a sharper turning radius than a Kubota tractor, okay? So I'm, I'm out here in the field running, trying to run this snake over. I mean, I'm doing circles and donuts the whole time, and I happen to be in front of the house. And my wife is in there in the kitchen doing something, and she looks out the window and somehow or another, she instinctively thinks, he's trying to kill a snake. And so I'm out here trying to kill this snake. I'm, trying to, I'm scared of him, by the way. I'm trying to run this snake over, trying to run this snake over. I'm not getting off the tractor to be with the snake, but I'm trying to kill him with a snake. And the next thing I know, I look up, and Jordan is standing there with a 20-gauge. And, and I look up, and she's standing there and doesn't say anything. I kind of put the tractor, and, you know, and hit the clutch, you know, and stop the tractor. Boom! She shoots the snake and turns around and walks straight back in the house. <laughs> Didn't say a word to me. And I have not, I shouldn't have said, I have not heard the end of that story. You know, Brother Robbie, you got to have your wife kill your snakes for you? I'm like, yeah, you're right, I do. And I'm proud to admit it. I am afraid of snakes. You see, my reaction towards something, that's a true story, okay? You can verify with her. My reaction... To the snake in the field is caused by the way that I feel about snakes. You understand that? Our reaction to things are often called, caused by the way that we feel. Let me ask you this question this morning. How are you reacting to the resurrection of Christ? How are you reacting to Christ's resurrection? I mean, buddy, right? Is that not what we're here to do this morning? I mean, I know we've sang songs and, done, and this is a traditional thing in the South. We go to church on Easter. But at the end of the day, are we not here to worship the Lord because of the resurrection? I mean, that's what we're here to do, right? So I'm asking this congregation, who's the preacher talking about? Everybody here watching online and here in person. I am asking you this morning, how are you reacting to Christ's Jesus and his resurrection. How are we reacting? 
Because the way we react to Christ's resurrection, I really believe that it shows how we genuinely and truly feel deep down inside about Christ's resurrection and His Lordship. Amen? So I want you to do this today. Nobody here but us, okay? I want you to commit this morning to examining yourself as we go through this sermon. Examine yourself. Are you reacting in these four ways? Four ways. Four ways that I want to show you how we should be reacting to the resurrection of Christ Jesus. You should be in Matthew chapter 28. Matthew chapter 28. I want to read eight verses to you. I'm reading out of the New American Standard. The Word of God says this. Now after the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week... Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to look at the grave. And behold, a severe earthquake had occurred. For an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled away the stone and sat upon it. And his appearance was like lightning and his clothing as white as snow. The guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who has been crucified. He is not here, for he has risen, just as he uh, said. Come see the place where he was lying. Go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And behold, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. Watch this, verse 8, the important verse. And they left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy and ran to report it to his disciples. Before we go any further, I want to give you a little context of what's going on here in this passage of Scripture. So on Friday, we're on Sunday here in this passage, but on Friday, Christ had been crucified. A week before that, a Sunday ago, a week before this time it takes place, Christ had entered triumphantly into the city of Jerusalem as the Messiah, the Palm Sunday. We celebrate that and it welcomed him. And in just a short amount of time on Friday, he is being crucified by the Romans. The Jews brought him to the Romans and brought him before Pontius Pilate and finally Pilate relents and he allows Christ to be crucified and Christ is scourged and nailed to a cross, and he dies that we might have remission of our sins. And Christ makes atonement for our sins on Friday. And he's dead. Christ isn't knocked out. He's not pretending. He is dead. And they take Christ's body and they put him in the tomb, in a, in a borrowed tomb of a wealthy man, a new tomb, and they seal it up. And then the Pharisees come to Pilate and they say, Pilate, we... we know that he, this man said he was going to be risen from the dead. And so we want you to send some guards and seal the tomb up so his disciples don't come and steal the body and make everybody think that he really rose from the dead. And so Pilate sends these guards and they go and they stand there before the, temp, the, the tomb and they seal it up so that none might come and steal. Now fast forward. We're Sunday. Saturday was the Sabbath. The women, they recognized the Sabbath. They observed the Sabbath. And then on Sunday morning, at the end of the Sabbath, they, they come to anoint the body to basically uh, uh, more appropriately embalm the body of Jesus. And they're on the way and they're wondering who's going to help us roll the stone away. And they get there and they find, guess what? The tomb is empty. And on this stone, there's an angel sitting, and they find out that Christ Jesus has been resurrected from the dead. You know, let me, let me just say this to you. You know the reason the stone was rolled away is not to let Christ out, right? It was to show us that Christ has really risen from the dead. Here's another little fun fact for you. You know, in Matthew's gospel, he, he says that it's women who report this first and foremost. But in this time, in this context, women's testimony didn't exist. So in a court of law, legally, a, a woman's testimony was, a, was, was not, a, not a valid point, okay? So what I'm saying is, is that had the writer of Matthew, the author of Matthew, trying to have been making, making this story up, he would have left out the part that women are the one who came and found 
him. It shows that Matthew recorded these verses exactly as they happened. So can you paint that picture in your head? This group group of women, they come to anoint the body and they find the tomb is empty. And Christ has been resurrected. That's a cool story, Brother Rob. But how does that apply to me? Well, what I want you to see, what I don't want you to miss this morning, is how they reacted, Mr. Paul, to the resurrected Christ. To seeing that Christ, to knowing, to believing that Christ has indeed been resurrected, I want to see this morning how they reacted. And I believe that we should react and be reacting basically in these same four ways. Number one, we should respond. You ready to take notes? (laughs) We should respond. We should react to the resurrection of Christ, ultimately his lordship in our life with proclamation say proclamation Proclamation. there's like 600 people in here let's try that again let's try it let's proclaim we should react to the resurrection of christ with with proclamation with proclamation look at verse 8 what do these women do And they left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy. And what? And they ran to report it to his disciples. What did they do, Bert? They went and they proclaimed this good news of Christ's resurrection to the other disciples. They run and they have this news that they're going to share with the other disciples. And they go back and they share this good news. News. Let me just tell you this morning, that ain't just any news that they were sharing, amen? I mean, that is the news above all other news. I mean, you can turn Fox News, CNN, turn it all off because this is the news that trumps and triumphs over all news. And that is that Christ Jesus is indeed raised from the dead. Listen to me, if you're a Christian here this morning, you have some news that you ought to be proclaiming as well. You have some news... You ought to be proclaimed. You know, it amazes me, Miss Beverly. It really does. What we proclaim and what news that we share in our daily lives, right? I mean, we, Ingemar won a basketball championship, right? Won a basketball championship. And look, I, we, we stopped somewhere, Avery, on the way home at eight, and we were in the restaurant, and we ain't even made it home yet. And people are like, hey, I heard Ingemar won the game. I'm like, man, we ain't even home yet. I just left in five minutes. How do you know? You know, five minutes down the road, right? Because people have what? Been proclaiming the news. You know, uh, uh, you have a baby. You have a baby. What do we do? We get on Facebook. You know, we do gender reveals, pop a balloon, shoot a shotgun, blow stuff up, right, for the color. We what? We proclaim the news that we're having a baby. We get married, we send out invitations, and we invite, we shout from the rooftops, Woo, we're getting married. We proclaim the news. What about the ice storm that we had, Stoney? I mean, that's all we talked about, right? Everybody talked about it. I go into Walmart, you know there's an ice storm coming. Really? I didn't know. Matt Lawball must not have told me. Right? No, that's all we do. We are a people who spread news, who proclaim news. So why is it? That we have such a hard time proclaiming the news that is above all other news. And that is the gospel of Jesus Christ. That he has risen from the dead. That's what these women did. They went and they proclaimed this news. Let me tell you the truth. Are you ready for this? If someone dies without the good news, they will perish. That is the truth. I know preachers don't like preaching about it. I know we don't like hearing about it. But guys, it is the gospel truth. If you die without ever hearing the good news of Christ Jesus, you will perish. That is the truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man come to me but by, no man come to the Father but by me. It is the only way. Radical.net, that's David Platt's website. Radical.net reports that over three billion people with a B, billion people on this planet are unreached with the gospel. 
That means that they have never heard the news. And statistically speaking, they will live, they, they will be born, they will live, and they will die without ever hearing this news that took place 2,000 years ago. What a shame that it is. You say, Brother Rob, it's unfair, is it? Or are we just not doing our part? Look down, Matthew 28. Look at the end of this chapter. Last two verses. It's written everywhere, five times in the, in the Bible. It's called the Great Commission. Jesus commissions all of us until he comes again to be doing this. Matthew chapter 19, excuse me, chapter 28, verse 19. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always, even unto the end of the age. Ladies and gentlemen, if you are a Christian... If you proclaim to be a follower of Jesus Christ, if you truly believe in the resurrection, if He is Lord of your life, what should result? Your reaction to the resurrection ought to be proclamation. It's not just for preachers, not for youth ministers, not for song leaders. It's for every single Christian. He didn't say in Matthew chapter 19, go you preachers and make disciples. No, he left that part out. You believe in Christ Jesus, you too have news to proclaim. And you and myself ought to be reacting with proclamation. Number one, the first reaction, the first reaction to the resurrection of Christ is proclamation. The second way we should be reacting to the resurrection of Christ is with haste. Say haste. With haste. We should be responding with haste. Watch this, verse 8. Watch, you ready? And they left the tomb, what? Well, let's try it again. And they left the tomb quickly. They left the tomb quickly. They didn't sit around and play spades and then go and proclaim the news. No. The resurrection caused them to have a sense of urgency. So they, let's, let's, put it, let's think about it now. So they come here and they, they see the tomb is open. Jesus has been resurrected. They believe the resurrection. They, oh, Jesus is risen from the dead. And immediately, immediately, they run. Their life has a sense of urgency about it from that point on. I think today... The truth is, is that many of us, when it comes to our spiritual walk, we have lost our sense of urgency. We've lost it. When it comes to spiritual things, we've lost our sense of urgency. Oh yeah, we're urgent about getting to the doctor. We're urgent. We're urgent about uh, getting to work or getting to that, that uh, gender reveal with the balloon pop and all that. We're urgent about that. But when it comes to our spiritual walk, we have lost our sense of urgency. Some have lost their sense of urgency in the sense that they've still not accepted Christ. I told you, the truth is, is you must accept Christ. If you want to be restored to a relationship with our Father in heaven, you must accept Christ. And there are people who sit in pews Sunday after Sunday and they grip the pew in front of them and they won't let go and they, and they hang on for dear life and they, they, they say, the Spirit, well, the Spirit convicts them and says, let go, let go, be saved, be saved, surrender, repent of your sins. Trust in Jesus to save you. And you say, well, I'll do it next Sunday. Not today. There's too many people here today and I look like an idiot and I don't want to do that. We've lost our sense of urgency when it comes to accepting Christ. We don't have a sense of urgency when it comes to getting right before the Lord. We have a pet sin that's in our life and we hold on to that thing and we, we say, yeah, I know the Lord doesn't like that and I ought to get it out of my life. I ought to put that sin to death. And, and, but, but it's okay. We're not in any, any hurry. We're not in any time crunch. And we put it off. And then when it comes to sharing the gospel, oh, how this world might change. How the world might change if 500 people got up. And with a sense of urgency shared the good news of Christ Jesus with those who are lost. You think, well, we live in the Bible Belt. Everybody's heard about Jesus. No, they're not. No, they haven't. We do this evangelism boot camp thing and we go out and share the gospel. 
once a, once a, once a month with the lost world around us. You know, they might have heard the name Jesus, but it amazes me how many have not heard the true gospel of Christ Jesus. Guys, we ought to be a people who live with urgency. Why, Brother Rob? Here's why. Because 100% of us, 100% of us, everyone in here will meet Jesus Christ. Every one of us. We will meet Christ Jesus. We will stand before him and give an account. That is the truth. Every single one of us. And you'll meet him in one of two, one of two ways. One of two ways. First of all, you'll meet him through death. Did you know? I got a statistic I read the other day. It was in the Wall Street Journal. I was reading it. Here's a statistic. You ready? One out of one people die. Did you know that? It wasn't in the Wall Street Journal. But it's a true statistic. You will die. I will die. We will all die. Every one of us. At some point, your life will cease and we will all die. You know, I, Mr. Paul, I, I talk to people all the time that are getting towards the end of their life. And, and one thing that I hear over and over again is just how short life is. They look back, they reflect back, and they think, wow, how brief life really is. I, I wear this bracelet. I wear this bracelet. And it's a bracelet um, that I got in the Marines, and it's honoring a Marine who died while I was in the Marine Corps. He was a younger guy, and he passed away. He had a wife, he had a daughter, had his whole life ahead of him, and he passed away. That was the end of it. But you know, I wear this bracelet more so now today, and while, yes, it's in memoriam of him, I wear it to remind myself just how brief life really is. That you are here today and then the next day you are gone. And at the end of the time, at the end of our road, the only thing that will matter is our relationship with Christ Jesus. That is it. Not your house, not your cars, not your family, none of that. Your relationship with Christ Jesus is all that matters. And it's, and every single one of us will face it. Hebrews 9.27 says, It is appointed unto men once to die, but then after this, the judgment. It is appointed unto man once to die. Ladies and gentlemen, if the Lord tarries, every one of us will die. And we will stand before God Almighty, Christ Jesus. You'll meet him through death or you'll meet him through his return. Through his return. Listen to me. Listen to me. You ready? Christ is coming back. Man, I thought, I thought, man, I thought we got some more amens than that. Did you hear me? Christ is coming back, guys. Christ, our Lord and Savior, hasn't left us here. He's coming back. He left uh, 2,000 years ago. He ascended to the right hand of the Father. And I'm telling you, one day he is coming back. Just as sure as you and I are sitting in these pews, Christ Jesus is indeed coming back. It may, it may, it may not be immediate, but it is indeed imminent. Christ is coming back. Revelation 22, 12 through 13 says, Behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Christ Jesus is coming back. And over and over in Scripture, he says, I'm coming quickly, I'm coming quickly, I'm coming quickly, I'm coming quickly. What if the church, what if the people of God live like it? What if we live with a sense of urgency? Like Christ could come back at any moment. I mean, like, really, what is Christ going to find you doing? Like, what if I'm picking my nose or something, you know? And Christ comes back. Sorry about that, Jesus, you know? Guys, we ought to be living our lives with a sense of urgency. In other words, what I'm trying to tell you is, is that because of the resurrection, because of our belief in Christ Jesus, because Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, what should result, how we should react to that resurrection is our lives having a sense of urgency about them. Number one, we should react with proclamation. Number two, we should react with haste. 
Number three, we're going to get out of here in just a few moments and you can go have your Easter supper. But until then, bear with me. Number three, number three, we should react. And this is not very popular, but it's truth. And I don't want to skip it. I don't skip things in the Bible. We should react with fear. We should react with fear. Look at verse 8. And they left the tomb quickly with what? With fear and great joy. With fear. I mean, think about it. Here are these, little, these women are, right? And they have just witnessed the resurrecting power of, of God on Christ Jesus. And he's been risen from the dead. A big earthquake has happened. And this dead man is now made alive. And there's an angel, an angelic being sitting there explaining all this to them. You think the women just walked up to the angel and was like, yo, what up, angel? How you doing today? You know, we boys, me and Jesus, we boys. You know what I'm saying? No. No. They reacted with a little bit of fear. A healthy fear. Not a, oh, I'm afraid this person's going to attack me, but a, but a, a humility. Standing in the presence of an angelic being in the work of God himself. There's a sense of fear. You know what the truth is? We've lost the fear of the Lord in America. Haven't we? I didn't want to bring this up, but I, I don't know all the facts. But I just heard that they made Easter Transgender Appreciation Day or something. Did you hear that? You know where that comes from? It comes from a lack of the fear of the Lord. That you can take the holiest day and profane it like that. I mean, look, if you're transgender, God loves you and he wants to save you and he wants to deliver you out of that. But a sin is a sin. But I'll tell you, the reason that we find ourselves in the place that we find ourselves in is because people have lost, this country has lost its fear of the Lord. But let me tell you, we're quick to amen, but... We're not much different. We're not much different. And at the end of the day, sometimes Brother Rob's not much different. We're quick to cast stones, say you ought to fear the Lord. But you know what? We're a people that have somehow decided to choose Little League over Jesus. I mean, Hebrews 10.25 says, Don't forsake the gathering amongst one another, as is the habit of some, even more so as you see that day approaching. That's a commandment, but yet we're so quick to choose Little League over Jesus. We're so quick to choose our work, our livelihood over Christ. I would, I would, I would make sure I spend time in the Bible and read and pray and get myself right with the Lord, but I'm just so tired when I come home from work. It's because we've lost our fear of the Lord. Uh, 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 our comfort, our comfort, it's just uncomfortable. Fishing, hunting, even our health. Even our health. We're choosing things over the Lord. We're all guilty of it at times, but it's the truth. And it stems from a fear of the Lord. You say, Brother Rob, that is, uh, it's old. But it's the truth. It's the truth. Psalm 111, 10 says this. The fear of the Lord is beginning of wisdom. All those who practice it have a good understanding, his praise endures forever. You say, that's Old Testament, Brother Rob. Well, watch this, Matthew chapter 10, verse 28. And do not fear those who kill the body. This is Jesus now speaking. But cannot kill the soul, rather what? Fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Luke 1, 50 says, and his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. Paul writes in Philippians 2, 12, so then my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. I could go on and on and on. The Bible talks about the healthiness of fearing the Lord. That is a humility, a humble posture to the Lordship of Christ Jesus. What did the thief on the cross say? What did the thief on the cross say to the other thief? I watched the Passion last night. They didn't put it in there. But what did the thief on the cross say to the other, cross, to the other thief? The other thief is mocking Jesus. Why don't you just save us, Jesus, and come down from there? And they're mocking Jesus. The other thief said what? Do you not, do you not fear God? 
Do you not fear God that you would mock Jesus? I would say to us, do we not fear God? Does the resurrection of Christ Jesus, God having the ability to raise someone from the dead, not strike a little bit of fear, healthy fear, into our lives? Because God is in control. Yes, He loves us. But guys, there ought to be some sort of healthy fear. I believe, and I know it's not popular. You're saying, I'm never coming back to this church again. That's okay. I believe the resurrection of Christ Jesus should cause us to have a little bit of fear. It did with these women, and it should us too. The resurrection of Christ... We should react with proclamation, we should react with haste, and then we should react with fear. And lastly, and we're going home, okay, so hang on. Lastly, lastly, and I love this. I really do, Avery. This is my favorite one. I love it. You ready? The resurrection of Christ Jesus should cause in us a reaction of joy. The resurrection of Christ Jesus should cause in us a reaction of joy. Of joy. Say joy. joy. Say it joyfully. Joy. joy. We should have joy. We should have joy. We should have joy. We should have joy, joy, joy. When we think, when we react to the resurrection of Christ Jesus. Look at verse 8. Watch this. And they left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy. Great joy. Yeah, they were a little afraid. They were all freaked out at the power of God. But at the end of the day, they had joy down within them that they were so joyful because Christ had indeed been raised from the dead. They were joyful. I mean, I got a picture of Stoney like, woohoo, like kind of freaked out, but woo, we're skipping down the road, putting their hands up, praising. We don't do that, we're Baptists, but they were putting their hands up. Because they were joyful. They were joyful. Think about this. Think about the time. Think about a time when you've been joyful in your life. I mean, think about a time when you have been like exceedingly joyful. Right? Like when you were just filled with joy. Can you th- take a moment? Take a moment. Think about that time. Think about that time in your life. Some of you playing basketball. Woo, you won the state championship. We are joyful. Doing victory laps on the court. What about when you killed a big deer, right? You know what I'm saying? Pow. Boone and Crockett, you know, pow. Yes, I'm going to show all those other guys how terrible of a hunter they are, right? Yeah, joy. Joy. You have joy. What about uh, something more serious? What about when your children were born? You remember that feeling, those who have children? The joy. What about time with your family? Marriage. You think about those joyful times? You know that feeling of joy that you have? Let me ask you this. What about when you pass from eternal death into eternal life? How did that bring joy? Well, I mean, literally, when you, when you, when you accepted Christ Jesus into your life and you were on your way to hell, you were condemned because of your sin, because of my sin, I was on my way to hell. And then Jesus Christ saved me. He stepped out of this, out of eternity and came to this broken place and he died on the cross so that I might have eternal life. And I turned from my sins and I trusted in Jesus. And somehow I passed from eternal death into eternal life. And I get to spend an eternity with Him. How much more joy should that bring us? I mean, that's the gospel. That's what we do this for. So that we can praise the one who saved us and we should do it joyfully. We should react to the resurrection of Christ Jesus. Not with moping, not with groping, but with joy. I mean, we walk into church all the time. Whoa, victory in Jesus. What, man? That ain't victory. That's not like defeat. No. Christ should bring us joy. John Piper defines joy as this. He says, joy is a good feeling in the soul produced by the Holy Spirit as he makes us see and savor the glory of Christ in the word and the world. That is what joy is. 
The Bible has lots to say about joy. The Bible has lots to say about joy. Philippians 4, 4, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Psalm 37, 4, delight yourself in the Lord. Psalm 32, 11, be glad in the Lord and rejoice. Psalm 16, 11, in your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. John 15, 11, Jesus said, these things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. The Bible says we ought to be a people who are joyful because we have passed from eternal death into eternal life. That's the gospel. You know what the gospel is? Let me, let me share it with you, okay? We hear that word all the time. Gospel singing, gospel music. He's a country gospel singer, right? We, we, <laughs> we hear that word gospel all the time. What does that mean? The word literally means good news. Good news. Well, in order for there to be good news, buddy, there's got to be bad news. And here's the bad news, that all have sinned. Raise your hand. Raise your hand. Who's ever committed a sin? You didn't know what I was going to ask. Y'all saw raising your hand. <laughs> Y'all ready to go home. Who's ready to stay for another hour, right? <laughs> Who's committed a sin? Raise your hand. Raise your hand. <laughs> yeah, some of you are committing a sin right now because you're lying, but that's okay. We've all sinned. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The Bible says even our righteousness is but filthy rags to the Lord. We have all sinned. And here's the truth. Sin is very serious to God. In fact, it's so serious that it desires, it requires a death penalty. The wages of sin is death. You know what a wage is? It's something you earn. You've earned a death. You have earned one death. That is what your sin owes. That's the bad news. We all owe it. That's why people die. But more importantly, that's why people die and they experience a, a, an eternal death. And apart from, Christ, uh, apart from Christ in a place called hell, that is what we deserve because of our sin. That is the bad news. We are all played with that disease. But the good news is this, Mr. Paul. You ready? Jesus didn't leave us there. Amen? He didn't leave us. You know what he did? This ain't like God being the big bully dad saying, yes, son, go down there and die for him. No, this is God incarnate, God in the flesh. He steps out of heaven and into this broken, sinful, fallen world. He lives a perfect, sinless life, a life we couldn't live. And he died on a cross for us. He paid our fine. Legally now, God can let you go free because your fine has been paid by Christ Jesus. He died in your place. It should have been Brother Rob that was pinned to a cross. It should have been Brother Rob that was beaten and mutilated for my sins. But instead it was Christ who did it for me. And what he requires is that we repent of our sins. John 3.16, let's go back. John 3.16, for God so loved the world, he sent his only begotten son, that whosoever, what? Believes, Believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. What does that word believe mean? It's a two-part word. It means to repent and to trust. You don't really believe until you repent of your sins and you trust in Jesus. That's true belief. You repent of your sins. You're going one way. You're living for yourself. You're living, uh, uh, you do, you're living in sin. You're doing all these things. And you decide, I am going to turn away from these things. That word literally means to make a U-turn or to turn around. So you turn around. You repent. And when you turn from something, guess what? Physics, you got to turn towards something, right? And that's the other side, trust. It's like you trust a parachute or a seatbelt to save you from your sins. And when you turn from your sins and you trust in Jesus, then and only then will you, do you truly believe in Jesus. It's not merely a belief in an existence. Like I believe in Martians living on Mars. No. It's deeper than that. That's part of it. Part of a belief in existence. But it's you're putting your whole trust and confidence that the atoning work of Christ Jesus will indeed save your souls. I'm here to tell you today that if you have done that, what should result, what your reaction should be, should be great joy. It should be joy, joy, joy. Because you have been saved from your and my sins. Amen? I don't want to go back through it, so I hope you get it. <laughs> I believe we should be reacting to the resurrection of Christ in certain ways. I'm going to take this clue to the green and cleaner, Grandma. I'm going to sweat it all in it. 
We should be reacting to Christ Jesus. The resurrection of Christ. In four ways. Four ways. We should be reacting with proclamation. We should be a people who are telling the world of the good news of Jesus Christ. We should be reacting with haste. We should live our life with a little bit of haste, a little bit of urgency. Because one day it will come to an end. We should live with a sense of fear knowing that God is sovereign. He's in control. He's on the throne. He's a loving God, but He's also a holy and righteous God. And we ought to be a people who live with a little bit of joy. Not like the world who has no hope, but believers, those who love Jesus, who've been saved by Him. They should produce in us a great and wonderful joy. I started off by asking you this question this morning. How are you responding to the resurrection of Christ Jesus? How are you responding? Ask yourself that question. Look at the mirror. I need to look at myself in the mirror. I started off with the snake story to show you that, to try to tell you that your reaction, the way you react, shows how you feel deep down inside. And if we're being very honest, once again, nobody here but us, but if we're being very honest with ourselves, the truth is, is that many of us are not reacting in those four ways. And at times, I'm guilty. You know what it means? It means something is wrong. It means something is wrong. If we're not reacting with proclamation, we're not reacting with, with, uh, with urgency, with fear, and with joy, something is wrong. Here's what it means. Either one... We've not accepted Christ Jesus as our Lord and Savior. You can't expect people to act like a Christian if you're not one. That's okay. We'll fix that today. Guys, you're not promised one more second on this earth. You could pull out of this parking lot, and that'd be the end of it. It's too serious to play around with. One preacher said, eternity is far too long to be wrong. So don't be wrong. If you're here today, and you don't know Christ Jesus as your Lord, look at me. Look at me. I am begging you. I am pleading with you. Turn from your sins, please. And trust in Jesus. He is offering you eternal life, free salvation. It's free. Take it. Turn from your sins and trust in Him. Because the clock is ticking. Maybe you're not reacting in these four ways because you've strayed from the Lord. You've drifted. Listen. We never drift towards these things. I don't. Maybe you do, but I don't. And if I'm not intentional about spending time in God's Word, spending time in prayer, spending time with the body of Christ, I'll drift away from it. And maybe we're not producing those things because we've drifted. You know, I, I'm leaky. I'm a leaky vessel. And unless I have a continual pouring, Mr. Paul, I'll leak out. And that's me. So maybe there's some here today who've drifted. They've drifted away. You're harboring a sin. You, you've just lost your, your urgency, your desire to serve. Let me say to you, the Lord is saying, come home. He's saying, come back. He's not like casting stones and saying, get yourself right before you come to me. No, he's saying, come to me and I'll make you right. He's here with open arms saying, come and cast yourself down and say, Jesus, I can't do it. I need you to do it for me. I'm asking you this morning, we're going to have an invitation time. That's a Baptist way of saying this is a time for you to respond to the conviction of the Spirit of God in your life. Right now. When we have this invitation time, this altar is going to be open, these steps, okay? You can come and pray. I'll be here to pray with you. Brother Avery's here to pray with you. Listen, if you're here, you don't know Christ, you come and you receive Christ as your Lord and Savior first and foremost. Number two, if you're here, if you're here and there is something that you need to get right before God Almighty, you come. Humble yourself. and say, God, help me. I humble myself before you. Restore me as you would have see fit to do so. Would you stand?
I'm asking you to come during the invitation time. The altar's here. I'll pray with you. Avery's here to pray with you. We have people that'll be happy to pray with you. I'm just asking you simply, would you come? Pray with me. Lord God, we thank you so much for this great and wonderful day that you've given us, Lord, to come in and to celebrate the mighty resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ. And I pray, Lord God, I pray, Lord, now that what results, what results from the resurrection is a changed heart, a changed life, a life that is dedicated and totally and completely sold out to you and you alone. Help us now this morning. Have your way with us, Father God. Help us to be obedient to what it is that you're calling us to do. Lord, we love you and we thank you. We pray all these things in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen. Hey, thank you so much for being here to worship with us online. If you'd like to make a decision today, call the number that's on your screen. We have counselors that are standing by that would love to help. If you're calling after our live services, leave us a message and some contact information and we'll get back with you. Thanks once again for being here to worship with us. I hope to see you soon in person and God bless.